It was August 1453. King Henry VI of England left his pregnant wife, Margaret of Anjou, at home and travelled from court to the West Country on a judicial visit. Stopping off at Clarendon Palace in Wiltshire, the 31-year-old king was, quote, suddenly taken and smitten with a frenzy and his wit and reason withdrawn. Now, I myself have a cold whilst recording this voiceover because that's how dedicated I am to giving you an immersive experience in this content. <coughs> So, what was the terrible and mysterious illness that struck down Henry VI, who was a central figure in the Wars of the Roses? Well, in today's episode, we're going to find out. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child. Henry V was dead. The great warrior king who had fought the French at the Battle of Agincourt and won against tremendous odds had been struck down at the age of just 35. His only child and heir, Prince Henry, was just a baby aged nine months when his father died. He was made King Henry VI of England and Lord of Ireland a day later on the 1st of September 1422, making him the youngest person to have ever ascended the English throne. On the 31st of October, his French grandfather, Charles VI of France, died, and in an agreement with the Treaty of Troyes signed by Charles and Henry V, the baby Henry was also declared King of France at just 10 months old. The infant Henry was unable to feed himself or dress himself. He couldn't walk or talk, let alone run the two kingdoms of England and France. Stupid baby. In a time when the mortality rate of children was extremely high, he might not even survive his infancy. Not for the first or last time during the Middle Ages was the future of the English monarchy unstable. Because Henry never met his father, growing up he had no concept of what made a great king. He had many Lancastrian uncles that could tell him how to behave and what to do, but no real role model to show him that the only way to be successful in medieval kingship was to basically be unpleasant and thoroughly ruthless. One of the best ways to prove greatness to his enemies and his subjects was in combat, but this way of demonstrating his worth was barred to Henry. Being an only child with no siblings and no heirs, his life was too important to be risked on the battlefield. With no way to prove his fighting prowess and bravery and overpowered by his uncles, the Duke of Gloucester and Bedford, he was just too young to deal with the pressures of kingship. Scandal The marrying of a French princess to an English king had become quite the tradition. For over 300 years, 10 out of the 11 kings of England had taken a French wife. So it was no surprise when Henry was betrothed to Margaret of Anjou, the niece of King Charles VII of France in 1444. They were married the following year, Henry was 23 and Margaret was 15 when she was crowned queen at Westminster Abbey. Although there is no way of knowing whether the marriage was consummated on their wedding night, we know that Henry was deeply devout and was given spiritual advice from William Ascough, the Bishop of Salisbury, who told him not to have sex with the Queen or to, and this is a quote, come nigh her, unless it was for the creation of babies. The virtue of chastity was admired by the Christian Church. It was an ideal held up by the clergy and an accomplishment which some strive to achieve. St. Edward the Confessor was one of Henry's favourite saints and was said to have remained chaste throughout his 22 years of marriage. The idea of an abstinence of sex within marriage was practised by some during the Middle Ages, although it wasn't all that popular for obvious reasons. Henry was deeply devout and famous for remaining a virgin until his wedding, but very early on the rumours about the royal couple's sex life, or lack of it, began. People were talking and they were saying that there was something weird going on in the king's bedchamber. Henry and Margaret were married for eight years before there was any sign of pregnancy. Proof has now been discovered that they needed a little help in the bedroom department. It seems that when Margaret joined her husband for marital relations, they were sometimes instructed by a retinue of sex coaches. Not just on their wedding night, but regularly, the Royal Book of Protocol states that when the king was in bed, quote, the king's chamberlain or a squire for the body came for the queen and with her two gentlewomen and an usher, and that when the, quote, king and queen lie together, the chamberlain spent the night in the same room. Nice. At the time, Henry's lack of experience and skill in the bedroom was played down. No one wanted a weak and impotent king, so it was contrived as being Margaret's problem. Nevertheless, the gossip began and this gave rise to the notion that Henry played a less masculine role within the marriage, that he had the more passive and queenly position. 
Hey man, I'm not judging. In chess, that's a good thing. Once Margaret did actually become pregnant, talk began that she had even taken a lover so that she could conceive. Now please don't kink shame King Henry down in the comments. Downfall by 1453, the Hundred Years' War had been going on for 116 years. On July the 17th, it appeared to be at an end, with the English well and truly defeated. The war had seen years of bloody conflict punctuated by long periods of peace, but now the French had won a decisive victory at Castellon in Gascony. The formidable English commander, John Talbot, the terror of the French, had been killed. Control over Aquitaine and Bordeaux were lost to France. Now only the port of Calais remained in English hands. The loss of Aquitaine was particularly humiliating for Henry. The region had belonged to the English for 300 years, ever since Eleanor of Aquitaine had become queen to Henry II in 1154. News of the failure reached Henry in August and probably contributed greatly to his severe mental deterioration. After his breakdown, Henry was brought back to Windsor and hidden away, his household trying desperately to keep the matter as quiet as possible. The illness did not appear to be physical, but rather a chronic mental infirmity. Today we would look for reasons along the lines of head trauma, shock, or some sort of mental break as a cause for Henry's collapse, and it's unknown whether the onset happened suddenly or whether Henry's health declined over a period of days. The medical chronicler John Bennett tells us that Henry became very ill. According to other sources, he quote, "...suffered a sudden and unexpected fright, becoming so ill that he lacked natural sense and intelligence sufficient to govern the realm, and that no doctor or medicine could cure him." Bede goes on to tell us that he was deprived of his sense and memory, unable to speak or use his limbs, incapable of even moving from the place where he sat. It would seem that Henry had become practically catatonic. Henry could have been more susceptible to mental illness. After all, he was the grandson of King Charles VI of France, known as Charles the Mad. In 1392, when Charles was just 20, he suffered from his first breakdown, which caused him to turn on his own men killing six of them, including his bodyguard, and attacking his own brother. He developed a fever and then became quite frenzied and paranoid, believing that assassins were coming for him. Charles refused to bathe or change his clothing for months on end. During one episode, his clothing was so badly soiled that he had to be restrained so that his sodden material could be peeled from him. Ugh. His body beneath was found to be infested with lice. He insisted that his name was George, wandered his chateau howling like a wolf, ripping down his wife's tapestries, and believed that he was made from glass. For the next 33 years, until his death, the king's health fluctuated between periods of mental clarity and instability. When rest and relaxation did not cure him, Charles was given an exorcism by two Augustinian friars and made to drink a concoction made from crushed pearls. Madness For the medievals, madness was thought to have been caused by either self-abuse, overindulgence, or an imbalance of the humours. At the time, medicine relied heavily on religion, astrology, and Galen's theory of the four humours. Any slight change of behaviour from the norm, either in a spiritual or physical sense, was seen as madness. This included anything from excessive sadness to loss of memory or seizures. Having spiritual visions or entering states of religious trances was tolerated, even valued. And mysticism flourished in England and other parts of Europe from the 13th to the 15th centuries. Many of these visionaries were venerated, such as Julian of Norwich or Catherine of Siena. Henry was already regarded as devout, even saintly. He was a peacemaker which made him a less successful king in an age where brutality and an iron fist were needed to hold on to power. A diagnosis of demonic possession would have been disastrous, not just for Henry's authority, but also for the whole Lancastrian dynasty, so that idea was quickly dismissed. In 1330, Bethlehem Hospital, which later became known as Bedlam, had been founded in London to treat the insane. Once an old priory for sick paupers, even the most respected and capable doctors there didn't understand what was happening to the king. It's possible that his grandfather Charles had been suffering from some form of schizophrenia, and that Henry could have inherited this. Although the symptoms of the two men are completely contrasting, it is possible that Henry was suffering from catatonic schizophrenia. He had become withdrawn and passive, as though he was in some sort of trance. He couldn't walk, talk, or even hold his head up properly, and sat slumped in his chair like a ragdoll. 
It was during this time that Margaret gave birth to their son, but even when the newborn was brought before Henry for a blessing, he remained in a trance-like state, and couldn't even look at his baby and only child, Edward of Westminster. It took almost a year and a half for Henry to recover from his mystery illness. Madness, adultery, illegitimate heirs, it was all perfect fodder for the Yorkist propaganda machine on their rise to power during the 1450s. Henry died either on the 21st or 22nd of May 1471, the consensus today being that he was murdered. Taken to the Tower of London, he was imprisoned for several years by the Yorkists after the Lancastrian defeat at the Battle of Hexham in 1464. His son Edward, the Prince of Wales, was killed at the age of just 17 on the battlefield at Tewkesbury, another decisive battle during the Wars of the Roses. Although Henry VI wasn't a successful king in his own lifetime, from a 21st century perspective we can appreciate the kind of unity that he was trying to achieve. A place of love and peace where everyone could get along. The Lancastrian Tudors in particular promoted him as a saintly figure who was murdered for his principles. It is very hard to diagnose Henry's condition hundreds of years later, and although many agree it was either catatonic schizophrenia or a depressive episode, it really still remains a mystery. Margaret tried to keep her husband on the throne for the sake of their son, but the country was falling apart and turned to Richard of York for some sort of stability. It is terribly sad to think how mental illness still devastates the lives of people and their families even today. For Henry VI, it was catastrophic. Would the Wars of the Roses have happened at all if Henry could have been treated for his condition? It would seem that the fragile state of King Henry VI's mental health actually changed the course of English history. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness, and thank you everyone that's been subscribing as we've just crossed the 10,000 threshold, which is an absolutely insane milestone, so thank you so much for that. I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you next week for another episode. Cheers!